Ahoy hoy, and welcome to the video. I'm Dr. Sumerian, not a real doctor, and today we're going to talk about how the SCP Foundation is... One of its core principles is actually pretty bad for the world in general. I'm going to move away from the word evil, but it's real bad. It's real bad. So what is it about the SCP Foundation? Well, I mean... Let's be clear, the SCP Foundation does lots of things that are very questionable. It's not entirely surprising to list off one of their core principles as, you know, bad. But the thing is, uh, it's one of the things that people least expect. So uh, I'd say the SCP Foundation has three core principles. They're secure, contain, protect, right? But what do those individually mean? I mean... You put things into boxes, but there's a reason for that. You put things into boxes so that the world is safe from danger most of the time. And it, that's one of the few things the SCP Foundation does that isn't actively evil. The second thing it does is technically protect a lot of anomalies from destruction. There are people in the world, or exploitation. There are people and or organizations out in the world who would exploit or destroy anomalies. The SCP Foundation keeps that from happening. Protect the world from anomalies is first, and protect uh, anomalies from the world is last. But second in there is keep knowledge of anomalies out of the hands and minds of the average public. Protecting normalcy. And this is where we run into the serious issues with the SCP Foundation's both mission statement and their actual actions. So the SCP Foundation is trying to keep every single bit of anomalous, uh, you know, every anomaly, every anything that they think of as non-normal out of the public eye. But this is hugely anti-progress. Now, what, it, what, what does that mean? Okay, well, let's talk about what normalcy is first. Normalcy is a completely subjective measure of the world and saying that this is what is or isn't, uh, the, this is the way things are or aren't supposed to be. Now, if you travel back in time, which itself would be an anomaly, but I mean mentally, if you travel back in time to 100 years ago, to 400 years ago, to 1,000 years ago, you will find that baseline normalcy is completely different than what we would consider today. Things that we consider commonplace, like, I don't know, a cell phone, for example. A basic cell phone is magic to someone just 100 years ago. To somebody 400 years ago, I mean, 100 years ago, you could kind of describe what it is in the terms of like, it's like your phone, but portable. And people will be like, wow, the technology must be really high for that. But for some people, it would just be straight up magic. Um, science might, scientists might be able to at least look at that phone and be like, okay, I can see the underlying principles, the radio waves and all these other things, microwaves technically, but it's regardless. Go back 400 years ago and it's just magic, period. Galileo, let's just, and Copernicus and, you know, there's a variety of old, uh, astronomers, uh, these astronomers, by the way. And this can be this can actually be useful in describing the difference between normalcy and not normalcy. Astronomers in the 1600s and so on were equal parts astronomers and physicists and all these and mathematicians uh, in a dual sense, also astrologers. You know, they were studying the stars primarily at first anyway, for the you know purpose of making predictions, horoscopes and that sort of things. Uh, that's something that's left to the, to the wayside quite a lot. Magic was something that sort of just, you know, we understood to be a real thing. And then as science progressed, we kind of moved out of that, you know. But that's the funny part. What was normal then <laughs> is also stuff that we would consider to be magical now. Like the idea that the Earth, uh, that the, the, the rest of the universe revolves around the Earth. That seems really wrong, but that was the normal at the time. And that's actually a very simple and very easy way to explain the difference between normalcy now and say a hundred years from now. And this is the problem with the SCP Foundation. Now we're going to bring it back around. 
the SCP Foundation is pre actively preventing progress, both scientific and elsewise, both, I should say, scientific, cultural, and societal progress is being actively prevented by the secrecy of the SCP Foundation. Now, from a writing standpoint, from a narrative standpoint, the masquerade or the veil or the, the idea that uh, this sort of magical stuff is kept secret makes sense. And in a lot of cases, there makes sense that some entity or organization is helping to keep these things secret. Uh, if you go into any sort of supernatural fiction, not all supernatural fiction, but most supernatural fiction has this narrative conceit uh, that uh, that magic and all these other things are not known to the wider world. Harry Potter is a good example of that. Um, uh, uh, Joss Whedon's Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel both have that exact thing. Vampires exist, but people are always surprised when they can, when they come up. Not everyone. Some people behind the scenes understand these things. Um, so you can go through any supernatural fiction and most of them have at least some, uh, masquerade or veil and the fuse that don't, you know, had a masquerade or veil that's been broken again, from a narrative standpoint, this is great. And for the SCP foundation, it's necessary for its narrative conceit because the narrative conceit of the SCP foundation is this could, this is our, this is our world. You've stumbled upon a database in our world. And therefore, there has to be secrecy relating to anomalies or else you would already just know about it. But the justification of it, of having the SCP Foundation be the group that is actually like the strong, not, not their only one, but the strongest towards keeping anomalies secret means that, you know, medical breakthroughs or technological breakthroughs or even just uh, in general life saving uh, technologies are actively being prevented from being uh, distributed worldwide, okay? SCP-500 can cure anything. You don't think the scientists of the world somewhere, somehow, uh, that aren't in the SCP Foundation might be able to examine those pills and, it, if not replicate it, at least draw uh, important, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, scientific breakthroughs from them, all of the anomalous animals or plants out there that are being kept secret. You have any idea how many life-saving drugs or life-changing treatments of disease have come about from studying novel animals and plants and the enzymes and the various chemicals that they produce, and then examining how they interact with bi biology and using that to develop other things. Science is all of this is the thing. Science isn't about being right. And I feel like the SCP foundation is set up as a sort of science forward, uh, quasi militaristic, uh, organization. And that's fine. But the fundamental understanding of science uh, for the SCP Foundation feels like it's the opposite of the way it should be. Because the SCP Foundation is about ensuring that science is right. And you might be thinking, well, of course, that isn't that the point. No, the point of science isn't to be right. That's the point of religion. Religion is about being right. Science is about being wrong about being able to make predictions about the world that match your findings and then being able to test those findings. If you can't be wrong, it's bad science. Okay. If, if, if there's no, you know, and if that's the thing, like there are science, there's science being done that is just plain wrong and they don't, and, but their findings come back and be like, yeah, absolutely. Everything is as, as it should be because the SCP foundation actively keeps knowledge from the scientific community where they could understand fundamental principles of the world of how anomaly and anomalies in the SCP foundation universe are part of the world. They follow underlying principles and it's possible that a, a, a grand scheme of physics and anomalous anomalous physics could be found if enough people came together to actually work on it. But nobody gets that opportunity because nobody knows that the magical uh, poop statue exists 
if they did, they'd be like, okay, well, let's put that, let's plug that into our data and start working on why this exists and how it works in doing. And, and, and let's not even talk about the individual costs of preserving the veil. Somebody discovers anomalies and they get amnesticized. And yeah, am I getting it right this time? Amnesticized. I want to say amne. It's amnest. Amnesticized. In a lot of cases, the amnestics are treated as though they aren't, uh, what's the word, harmful, okay? But I feel like that's, that's a cop-out in a lot of stories, and I think that it's, I think it's worth it. In many of the stories I've written, and I've written quite a lot for the SCP Wiki, uh, I'm going to probably start <laughs> continuing, continuing forward at least, uh, when amnestics are used, understanding that there is a cost associated with wiping somebody's memory. Um, because otherwise I feel like that you're missing some narrative uh, value there, but regardless, amnestics probably have a permanent long-term effect on somebody's mental well-being. They, they must, um, because of the way the brain works. And if not, they're magical. And also, could you imagine the usage of amnestics on people with traumatic experiences? If somehow it literally wipes them from your brain and all of the effects of what happened from them? And this is the this is the, this is just an example. The SCP Foundation has a tool which would be incredibly useful to a wide range for a wide range of psychiatric illnesses, and they keep it secret. The SCP Foundation's active control of the veil and actively promoting the uh, the secrecy around anomalies is an evil. Actually, I've, I didn't. I said at the beginning I wasn't going to say that. I've actually changed my mind. It is an evil because you are actively, maliciously hurting the world by doing so. And I don't really think there's much of an argument to be made elsewise. Like, what is what's going to happen? What, what, there's there's this, this idea in fiction that if we knew that, for example, aliens, if we knew that aliens existed, oh my God, all the world religions would fall. No, they wouldn't. They'd spend a day having an existential crisis, and then the next day they would come up with, this is how this the aliens uh, fit into our scripture. Look, right here, it talks about angels coming down from the sky. That's what these guys are. That's it. That's, that's what happens. Religion's not going to be upended by knowledge. They just... <laughs> They ignore the knowledge that doesn't fit with what they think it does and the stuff that's unignorable. They integrate into the religion. That's how religion functions. Uh, anyway. Or the world being like, oh my god, uh, we have a cure for cancer now. That's going to... What? No. That's not going to cause... I mean, that will cause societal shifts, by the way, because cancer is a primary driver of death so let's say you cure cancer and heart disease but you don't cure cognitive decline well that's going to put a huge pressure on uh, on societies and cultures uh, when they have to care for their 80 90 100 130 year old uh, relatives and or just people in society in general who you know can't care for themselves anymore <laughs> So yes, there would be societal effects, but the societies would adapt to them. The worst part of all is that because of the arresting of natural progress, now there is an argument to be made that there would be some harm from the masquerade of the veil being broken because they've kept it secret for so long. They've held back the water for so long that when the dam does break, there will be consequences. But I still don't think those consequences would be serious enough to actually be a serious issue. Like I said, with the let's say you find a cure for cancer and uh, heart disease, it's the one of the primary death types of death in the world is cancer or heart disease. Uh, if you cure these things because you've not because the progress didn't come gradually as it would have if you had done nothing, if you not interfered because that progress doesn't come gradually. Yes, society would, you know, have a whole generation of people who are 130, 140 years old that would have to be cared for in a certain way. But again, that assumes you can't cure cognitive decline, which maybe you can. 
the whole situation is you've created your own problem and then been like, well, we have to do it because, you know, if we don't, the problem that we created will uh, by doing it will become a problem. No, just get the fuck out of the business, man. Keep the dangerous stuff in a box and let the rest of the stuff and like keep the dangerous stuff in a box and keep it publicly documented, you assholes. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, hit the subscribe button and then hit the notification bell next to that so you're notified when I upload new videos. And then head on over to patreon.com forward slash D Sumerian and pledge at any level like everybody here on the screen already has, including MC Cashmill, who has pledged at $50, and Sinjariki, who has pledged at $100. It is nice to know that I'm not alone out here. And also, I guess I can say this now that it's over. My birthday was yesterday. I am 36 years old now. That is something to think about. But it is nice to know that I'm not alone out here. And I will see you all again on Thursday.